I don't know. I mean, I'm sure I'm not the other one. Anybody ever been in a season where you just had so much on your mind? So much on your mind, you were wrestling with thoughts day and night. Even in the hours when you should be sleeping, you're up wrestling with thoughts. Anybody ever been there before? Has anybody ever had so much to, to carry, so much that you're being, is being pulled on you? And, you? and you wonder and question if you have enough strength to continue. You know, even last night as I, I woke up suddenly around 4 a.m. And I said, you know, as I was laying there, let me just meditate on this message. And even then, all these thoughts just begin to flood my mind. All these things that I have to do, all these burdens that I'm carrying, and, and, and it can happen that fast. All of a sudden, you're there, and there's no peace, and you're there, and all you can do is be consumed by all that is on your plate. Anybody ever felt like their plate is just too full sometimes to carry? You know, there's a scripture in the, in the Bible that says God, he, he helps the falling, and he lifts those who are bent beneath their loads. Sometimes you can carry a load that's so heavy that you feel like you can't stand straight up. I remember that I was in college and I remember there was a, a season when Josh and Jada was much younger. Lily and Gabrielle was not here yet. And I remember that Sue and I, we were just, we moved back down from Tallahassee and we were just trying to transition. We were newlywed still, but we, you know, we were young and married and Josh came and then later Jada came. And so we were in school, and it, was, it felt like there was so much on our plates because we, I was in school full-time, I was working full-time, but then also in the program that I was in, I had to meet certain clinical rotation hours every week. And so it just felt like the plate was, was heavy. And the thing about it with stress sometimes is you don't know how much you could be under until it comes and it manifests into some sort of physical results. You know, I always say your body will whisper before it yells. And I remember I just knew that, you know, I had a crazy schedule. I was working on campus. I was there at 5 a.m. to 11. Then I had classes and I had rotations. And sometimes I would work even in the evening. And I just remember that I just felt overwhelmed one week and I was just completely tired. And I went and I was in the bathroom one morning brushing my hair before I left the house for the day. And as I was brushing my hair, I felt something fall across my face and into the sink. And when I looked down, I saw a big patch of hair that fell off of my head. And that was an eye-opening moment. And I realized how much I was carrying. And the thing about it is sometimes is that when you're carrying a burden that's so heavy, you get used to it. You start to adapt that even to the point where you don't even know how to let it go. You don't even know how to give it to God. You know, the Bible says we ought to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. What I love in that, word, in that scripture is the word to cast. You know, we have Dr. Gallimore here today who's a professional fisherman. And he'll tell you, you know, when it comes to casting, you're casting as far as you can. It's a difference between casting and handing off. When you're handing off, there's a, you have the chance to continue to hold on. But when you're casting your cares to God, you're saying, I'm letting go completely. I remember when Josh was just, uh, he was maybe four or five, and we were teaching him about, you know, just the value of, of finances and budgeting. Because every time he went to the store, you know, what does the kid say? I want this. I want that. I want this. And so we started teaching him. We giving him money. And I remember, you know, he had money, and we were going to the store. And he will say, Daddy, can I come with you? And I know that when he says that, it's because he's, he's interested in coming home with something special. And I say, okay, you can come. Just bring your money with you. And so I remember he was maybe four or five. And we went to the store, and we was, at the, at the, at the, we was checking out. And there was a candy bar that he saw that he wanted. And he said, Daddy, can I have that? I said, sure, go ahead. Make sure you take your money out so you can pay for it. And the cashier is laughing, but I wasn't joking. And so we, we got to the, to the register, and so I said, <laughs> I even used a divider between my stuff and his I, on the conveyor belt. <laughs> you know, I was like, this stuff, oh, that's not mine, that's his. And she's looking over the counter, and he's standing there with a candy bar in his hand. And so it came to the time when he was supposed to pay for his, his candy bar. It was like maybe 80-something cents. 
And so I said, okay, you put the rest of your money back. It's a dollar. You're going to give her the dollar. She's going to give you back change. And so he put his money in his pocket, and he's giving her the dollar, the dollar in one hand and the candy bar in the other hand. And so a transaction is taking place. I'm taking my stuff and putting it in the cart. And then I turn around and, and witness that Josh is now in a tug-of-war match with the cashier. Because he's holding on to the candy, but he won't let go of the money. And, she, and he's almost about to pull her over the register. And I'm like, Josh, what are you doing? And he's learning that there's a transaction that takes place. And for some of us, that's what our prayer lives look like. We're saying, God, I'm giving you my cares because he says, come unto me, all who are weak and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. There's a transaction that play, takes place when we enter into the presence of God. But so many times we go into his presence with our worries, and we're saying we're giving it to him. And when we say amen, we take it right back. He's saying to cast your cares upon him. And I believe this morning that somebody needs to let go of something you've been holding on to for so long. I believe this morning God wants to do a transaction. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I believe this morning somebody, you came here today and your heart is heavy. Your mind is, is not at rest. And somebody needs the peace of God. Anybody needs the peace of God this morning? There's seasons we can go through in life where we just don't feel any peace. There's seasons when we go through in life where the song opens up. She says, are you, are you tired or feeling weary? Anybody ever felt just tired and weary? It's like the moment you try to overcome one obstacle, there's another right behind it waiting on you. But today, amen, we're believing that there will be a transaction that shall take place in this house. Amen? That God, that, that somebody may have a breakthrough in their lives, whatever your concern or your worry is. You know, there's, it, it's scary sometimes when you're going through a situation. And I remember in that time in my life, I, I, I was losing my hair. I, was, I probably was 25 years old at the time. And I went to the doctor, and the doctor was like, you're too young to be going through this. How much stress, how much, how much worry is on your plate? How, are, are you, do you feel anxious? And they started to go through these questions. And I remember there was even stuff showing up on tests, and, and it was like, whatever we need to do, you need to turn this whole thing around. And I had to learn. I remember one day I went to, to the altar to pray, and I went. It was a church I was visiting, and they were talking about people who were going through situations. And I went for it, and I prayed, and the pastor had to pray with me. And it was in that moment that I finally let it go and said, God, I'm giving it all to you. And that was the turning point. Sue can tell you, I wish I can say I was, I've been a man of faith my whole, there was a time I struggled with worry. I was a worrier. I would worry. The simple things that would happen, I would begin to worry because I'm like, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a young father now. I'm a new husband. I got to make sure everything's okay. And the Bible says, and Sister Solon, she preached, she, she mentioned it in, the, in her prayer. Proverbs 3, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understandings and all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths another translation said, and he shall make your paths straight if there's somebody here this morning and you're going through a season in your life and you feel like you don't have any peace you feel like that your mind is just flooded with all these concerns and worries Today, I believe this message is for you. I would like you to open your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Father, we thank you again that we can rely on you. Teach us how to let go and let God. Teach us how to let you be God in our lives and let go. And so that we could become lesser so that you may become greater. Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus that even now, deliverance can begin to take place in the hearts of the people who needs to, take, who needs to, to get over this obstacle that's been weighing them down for days, weeks, or even months or years. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, this is a passage of scripture that always seems to grab my attention because we're talking about the prophet Elijah. 
a great man of God. You know, we, we read about Elijah. We read about all the, the acts that God has done through his life. Before getting to chapter 19, it was only two, chapter go, t- two chapters ago in chapter 17 where Elijah was brought onto the scene. In fact, the first scripture, when it, in the first verse, when it talks about Elijah, God is calling Elijah to go and speak to King Ahab. You know, Bible commentaries will tell you that this was a, a very concerning time in the, in, the, in, in the Israelite community, in the history of the Israelites, because their hearts were being strayed, strayed swayed to, pray, to, to praising God, a Baal. Because in that time, there was over 450 prophets of Baal all through the town. And there was a king after king after king that were evil kings that was not worshiping the true God. And so now God has to get the attention of the people and Elijah comes. And from from the moment he comes, he's a spiritual force. And God says to Elijah, go and prophesy to King Ahab and tell him that it's not going to rain. And in chapter 17, verse 1, is when Elijah says, No rain or dew shall fill the earth except at my word. The Bible tells us in James 5 and 17 that it did not rain for three and a half years. We live in South Florida. Rain is a daily occurrence for us. Imagine it not raining for three and a half years. And so there was a severe drought and a famine that took place. And Elijah prophesied to King Ahab, and just as he said, the rain stopped. And so as you continue to chapter 17, this is when God is doing acts of great of miracles and signs and wonders through the prophet Elijah. He meets the widow who was in the field gathering sticks because she's run out of food. She's run out of oil. So he says, what are you doing? She says, I'm gathering sticks to start a fire so I can cook my last meal because after this, my son and I is going to die. There's nothing left to eat. And so, so Elijah speaks a word to her and she obeys. And the Bible says a miracle was performed because she had, the Bible says, she went from having nothing to eat to plenty to eat because she obeyed the word of the Lord through the prophet. Later on in chapter 17, that same, pro- that same lady, the widow, her son got ill, became ill. And, and now she, to the point where he died. God used Elijah to come and pray over her son. Not even pray healing because he was already died. He prayed over her son and the Bible says her son came back to life. Amen. Even towards the end of this chapter 17, she says, now I know. That you are a man of God. In chapter 18, this is where they, they now Elijah has to confront King Ahab. All these years of wicked, evil kings that is, that is causing the people to not worship the true and living God. God used this one prophet, Elijah, to stand on Mount Carmel. And this is what we read about the contest of Mark, Mount Carmel. Where El- Elijah against his 400 false prophets of Baal. And they said, this is what we're going to do. He looked at the people and says, if Baal be your God, worship him. But if my God is your God, worship him. The people didn't say anything. They were confused. They didn't know what to do. And so Elijah said, this is what we'll do. You, all you false prophets, you set up an altar to your God. And I will set up an altar unto my God. We will, we will set the sacrifice, but we will not light a match to it. Whosoever altar catches fire without anyone lighting a match to it, that person serves the true living God. And so he gave them the opportunity to go first. And the Bible says in chapter 18, from sun up to sundown, they were worshiping and calling on their God Baal. Even starting to cut themselves and, and having their blood pouring from their bodies to try to cause Baal to respond to them. Nothing happens. Elijah says, okay, it's my turn now. And he prayed. And as soon as his prayer ended, the Bible says a fire came down from heaven so strong that it didn't just consume the sacrifice. Even the water around the altars was singed up. Then the people say, we serve the God of Elijah. And it was not just that. I'm talking about what God has done with Elijah just between these three three chapters. Afterwards, Elijah killed the 450 prophets of Baal. Then the Bible says he prayed that it might rain so for the first time in three and a half years. And the Bible says when the clouds became dark, the sky became dark, he urged everybody to get back to town before the storm came. And God gave him the strength on feet to outrun horses and chariots to get back into town. 
So this is what Elijah's legacy has been so far, just from the moment of chapter 17 being introduced to now. But now there's a sudden turn of events. And I just want us to just pay close attention to this. If you're in 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse 1, it says, When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them. Elijah was afraid in verse 3 and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and left his servants there. Then he went on alone into the wilderness traveling how long? Verse 4. He traveled all day, and he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. You hear that? Listen to what he said. This is the New Living Translation. He says, I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. Then he laid down, slept under the broom tree. And, but then he laid down and swept, slept under the broom tree. Now, every time I read this, I'm always taken back. Because we know about Elijah, the prophet of God. And you, and you may not hear many people talk about it, but even this prophet of God went through a season of depression in his life. I don't, and no, as human beings, nobody is exempt from trials and tribulation. Jesus says, in this life, you will face trials of many kind. But then he says, be encouraged, take heart, for I have overcome the world. Even when he talks about the wise man who built his house upon the rock and the foolish man who built his house upon the sand, it says, when the rain came tumbling down, the wise man's house stood firm. But it doesn't say no one was exempt from the rain. Amen? And so we all go through situations in life that can challenge our faith. How did Elijah go from being on the top of the mountain at the peak of his faith to being in the valley where he's begging God to die? He went from praying fire from the sky to now asking God to kill him. You see how fast things can just happen? How fast situations can turn around and suddenly we're just now gripped with worry or as they say in the song, burdened with a load of care? And so I'm, I'm reading this and I'm like, wow, this nobody is exempt, but there's still, there is hope. Amen. Sue and I was reading and um, there was a scripture that was the verse of the day this past week. And it was taken from the book of, of Psalms. And it starts to talk about what it means to be anxious. Amen. And, and there's different ways that it put it. It might be small, so you might not be able to read it. But we were sitting there. We was driving, dropping the kids off to work. And we was talking about this in the, in the car. It says in Psalm 94, 18 and 19, it says, the psalmist says, When I said my foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me what? Brought me joy. But look at, look at the expression. When I said my foot is slipping. You know, it's like sometimes we can, we can feel like we're as sure-footed as a deer, as the scripture says. But then there's times in life where something can happen and tragedy can strike and you feel like you're slipping away. Amen? You feel like there's so much on your mind and you're not, you're not as strong in your faith as you was back then. Donnie McClurkin says it like this in his song. I know that faith is easy. When everything is going well. But can you still believe when your life's a living hell? There are situations that can come into our lives and suddenly where we had all the faith, we can feel like we have no faith left. But look what the psalmist says. He says, when I said my foot is slipping, what happened? Your unfailing love supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. And so we were reading this, and it says, okay, it talks about being anxious. But it doesn't really break that down. It just says, when, ex when anxiety was great within me. So we, we looked into the New Living Translation. And it says, when I cried out, I am sleeping, I am slipping, but your unfailing love, O Lord, supported me. Now look at this explanation. When doubts 
filled my mind. Your comfort, Lord, renewed, gave me renewed hope and cheer. How many of you ever felt that way before? Like you just, from, from, you just felt like there was doubts that was in your mind that, and you, didn't, you wasn't sure that what you were believing God for that was going to happen for you. Anybody ever experienced something that was just your obstacle was so great and, and you just didn't know? Sometimes it could be a, 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 a report from the physician. Sometimes it could be a financial situation and you don't see where it's going to come from. Anybody ever been there before? And all of a sudden, you know, your doubts start to fill your mind. You know, that's when the enemy comes in and says, you heard what they said? They said they can't do nothing else for you. People don't recover from this. You heard what, you, you, you heard what the economist said? It's going to get worse before it gets better. You don't have enough money. You, you, there's, you can't find a job. They're not hiring. Your business is going to fail. Do you see? And, and all of a sudden, you just start to hear, yeah, the people are being priced out of homes. What if you end up homeless? What if this? What if that? And that's how the enemy operates. Sister Sandra, what'd you say? He is, the, he is a liar. Sister Sandra walked up to church, into church today, and the first thing she said is, the devil is a liar. <laughs> I said, I don't know what happened, but the devil's in trouble. <laughs> I don't know what he tried, but he's in trouble because Sister Sandra's on his case. Amen? And so, it says, when doubts filled my mind. Yeah, that, who's been there before? Who's been there before? Who, who's lost sleep because of what was happening, the battle that was taking place in your mind? Hallelujah. Look what the, look what the King James Version says. Sue said, that's, that's, that's King James. Go to King James for me. And so I pulled it up, and look how the King James described it. When I said, my foot slippeth, thy mercy, O Lord, held me up. Listen to this. In the multitude of my thoughts within me. It described being anxious of having a multitude of thoughts. This is when they say, oh, my mind is filled. My mind, my thoughts are heavy. That, that one negative thought turned into a train of thoughts. You ever heard that expression? The train of thoughts, the pattern of thoughts. It can happen so easily. And I believe that's where Elijah is. Because if you look through the scriptures, if one thing he kept declaring up until this point, he says, I'm the only prophet left. They killed all the other prophets. I'm the only prophet left. They killed all the other prophets. King Ahab and, and Jezebel. And now he received a message that she says, it may God strike me and even kill me if you are not dead by this time tomorrow. He just came back from a victory and the Bible says he is on the run. But there's a way to bounce back from being anxious. Amen. There's a way to bounce back when you feel like your mind is flooded with thoughts. There's a multi there are doubts fill your mind. Amen. And today we're going to talk about that really quickly. So if you go back into the scripture... Verse 5 says, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Verse 7 says, then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him. And said, get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food, uh, ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai. The mountain of God, uh, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Then he came to the cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Go outside and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And, and as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. And such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Somebody say gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went outside and stood at the entrance of the cave. 
You know, one of the first things that we have to do when we are troubled, you know, and we're facing a situation, we have to learn how to take a moment to go to our quiet place. Elijah was there. He heard the word that had came, and the Bible says he ran to Mount Sinai. Amen. He ran. He had to be removed from the situation. I remember I was at work one day and I was just overwhelmed with everything that was going on. And anybody has ever been, had so much in their mind that you couldn't even concentrate? And I'm sitting there and I'm supposed to do something and I can't even get it in my head what I'm supposed to do. And suddenly I heard, go take a walk and go pray. There's times we have to get up and go and just say, God, I'm going to come spend some time with you. I have, I'm, I'm too, I, I'm too encapsulated. I'm too in the, in, surrounded by what's going on in my life that that's, it has all my attention and all my focus. When you're in a place in your life where your problem has all your focus, you won't experience anything but anxiety. You won't experience anything but stress and worry because all your attention is on what you're going through. And sometimes you have to be like David and remember, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. David is in the midst of running for his life, but he remembered that he, got, he has a promise from God that one day he'll sit on the throne of Israel. Amen? And so Elijah runs to Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai is also known as Mount Horeb. There's something very significant about this place. It was on Mount Sinai where in Deuteronomy where God revealed himself to the people and he, did, and he, and he established a covenant with them. He had just delivered them from slavery, and it was at Mount Sinai where God now he, he expressed to them who he was and what his promises was for them concerning the promised land. It was on Mount Sinai where, where Moses spent 40 days and came back with the Ten Commandments. In fact, it was on Mount Sinai, also known as the Mountain of God or Mount Horeb, is where it, even Moses himself, even before being sent to Egypt, where he was out tending to the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro where God revealed himself to him near the slopes through the burning bush amen what am I saying here sometimes you just have to step away from what you're going through and you got to go back to the beginning go back to where it all started with God go back to where where you know that time in your life where you was just on fire for God you were reading the scriptures you were praying every day you know you got to sometimes you got to detach yourself from what you're going through and look back over your life and the faithfulness of God we just declared all my life you have been faithful all my life you've been so good and with every breath that I'm able I will sing of the goodness of God sometimes you got to dwell on what God has done for you to help you in what you're going through Amen? And so you got to get up and you got to step away. And what's also interesting is that not only do you have to separate yourself from your situation, sometimes, number two, you got to separate yourself from your own thoughts. I went outside when I was at work and, and the Lord said, go take a walk. I went and I started to take a walk and I was still feeling anxious. He was like, you left your work behind, but you didn't leave behind your cares. You brought your cares with you. And that's exactly what we saw with Elijah. Elijah went to the mountain and, and, and God, he heard God's voice. God said, what are you doing here? And he carried with the same narrative. Oh, I'm the only prophet left and they're going to kill me. And it's interesting because God asked him twice, Elijah, what are you doing here? Finally, the Lord says, go outside and stand. And he went outside and stand. There was an earthquake and the rocks came loose. He wasn't in an earthquake. There was a wind. God wasn't in the wind. There was a fire and God wasn't in fire. And the Bible says suddenly he heard what? A gentle whisper. Sometimes there's so much going on in our minds that we just can't hear the voice of God. God is speaking to us. The Bible says he'll never leave us or forsake us. Sometimes we're just not in the position to hear his voice. Because all we're thinking about is the things that we're going through. And sometimes we just got to refocus our mind. Amen? Come on, look to your neighbor and says, refocus your mind on God. It's quiet in here. Come on, look to your neighbor and say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Remember the hymn that says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Brother Victor is, 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 on, is with me on that one. 
Sometimes you have to separate yourself from your situation. You got to go to your quiet place. How many of you ever seen that movie War Room? Anybody seen War Room? After watching that, I was so inspired. It's Acts 2 and I went and I said, I'm going to clean out our closet. I don't know what I'm going to do with our clothes or what, you know. But I went in there and, and we set up a place. And sometimes we just have to get up and go to that place. My mom, when she worked, she was in, in healthcare for over 25 years. And there was a place near her job where there was like a walking trail around a big, I don't know how many miles it was. And on her lunch, she would put on her sneakers and go and walk. And she always tell us, she says, there's, this, there's, this, there's four different trees. There was four of us, my older brother, my older sister, myself, and my younger brother. And she says, I would go to this tree and I would pray for my eldest son. Then as I continue walking, I would stop at this tree and pray for my sister, Jennifer. Then I would keep walking, and there was this tree where I prayed for Josh. And she said, and the roots just represents all the children and everything that's coming out. But she had a meeting place with God. Every day on her lunch, she would get up, no matter what she's going through. And because she knows she was a nurse case manager, so she dealt with a lot of issues that were going on. She was a problem solver. But sometimes you can listen to so much problems that you don't have time to deal with your own. And so she would get up on her lunch and go and walk, and she would go and pray. And she did that for years. And, she, and it got to the point where it was almost like it was a meeting place for God. Like God was expect her there. And every time she prayed, she would just feel his presence. How many of you have a meeting place with God? You, how many of you have a meeting place? Maybe it's in your car rides on, over to work. You know, I was talking to Brother Victor, and Brother Victor says on his treadmill, he'd be shouting hallelujah and, and just lifting his hands as he's listening to worship music. He has a meeting place with God. You got to have a meeting place with God. If you're anxious right now, if there's a multitude of thoughts in your mind, or as the scripture says that if, if doubts fill your mind, sometimes you got to remove yourself from the situation and go to your meeting place. Elijah was so surrounded by so much noise that he couldn't hear God where he was. And when he went and finally went to the meeting place, he was removed from the situation, but the cares were stayed in his mind. Amen? And he had to, and, and it's interesting because he's looking for God in the windstorm. He's looking for God in the fire. He's looking for God in the earthquake. Sometimes if we don't see God move in such a miraculous may, way, we feel like he's not with us. But sometimes you just got to turn down the noise. Amen? Prayer, when we pray to God, that's how we communicate with him. And there was one Bible study with the young adults. We were talking about this. Prayer is communication. And what we know about communication is that it's a two-way two -way street. How often do we go into prayer and, say, and, 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 and let out our laundry list of concerns to God, say amen, and walk away, and God can't even get a word edgewise? How often do we go into prayer and not speak, but listen? My dad will always say this. You have two ears and one mouth. So that means you have to listen twice as much as you speak. <laughs> and, you know, and so you know, how often do we go into prayer and say, God, I thank you for life and for waking me up this morning. But I'm here to hear from you. You hear from me all the time. I'm here to hear from you. You know, and that's communication. Amen? That's how you communicate with people in the flesh, right? When you're talking to someone, they speak, you speak. I've seen conversations where everybody's speaking at the same time. That's confusion. Amen? You got to have an opportunity to just listen and say, God, what do you have to say about this? One of our young adults came back with a testimony. And I was like, yo, Josh, guess what happened? You're a young lady. And I was like, what happened? She was like, I, I, I did what you said. And I didn't know what she was talking about because that was like a week ago. You know? And she said, no, last Bible study, you said prayer is a two-way street. And I was concerned about something with my job or whatever the case was. And she said, I went and I sat there and I prayed. And I just sat in the presence of God and listened. And she said, as I was listening, I just kept just this, a scripture just came into mind, you know, and, and she said, I didn't know what it was. I kept hearing a reference, Psalm something. I don't remember what she told me. Psalm, Psalm something chapter, Psalms. And she's like, what is that? And then she realized, well, maybe I should go read that. And she said she went and opened the Bible to that passage and she began to read and it was concerning the exact thing that was on her heart. She said, I got my answer right there. All I did was give God a chance to speak in the conversation. Amen? We have to have a meeting place with God to separate ourselves, that quiet place. But also when we get there, 
we got to also separate ourselves from our thoughts. Sometimes we just got to just turn all the noise down. No, I'm not thinking about any of this. Because how many of you ever tried to pray and you're just thinking about everything you left behind? You're trying to pray and you were like, man, if that kid does that one more time, if my child do that one more time. You're trying to pray and you're like, my coworker say one more thing. You know, you're trying to pray and all you can think about is what you're wrestling with. And after you come out of prayer, you don't even remember what you said to God. You just had a whole communication with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords said amen and don't even remember what it was about. We got to give God our full attention when we get into that quiet place. Amen? Because you'll be surprised at what you'll hear him say in your heart if you give him a chance to speak. When the multitude of thoughts filled my mind, we got to sometimes say, I'm not thinking about anything except for what God has for me. And sometimes you just got to go into that quiet place with some worship music. I know anytime I'm playing worship music, all of a sudden now I, I get, I stop thinking about the situation and now I'm focusing on God. Amen. Sometimes you just got to get a good worship going. You got to get a good praise going. All of a sudden you'll start to experience the peace of God. Amen. And you start reading the scriptures and all of a sudden you start getting revelations. The Bible says if you draw near to him, he'll draw near to you. If you seek him, you will find him if you seek with all your heart. Amen? And so the first thing to do is what? To separate yourself from the situation. Amen? The second thing to do is you got to separate yourself from what? Your thoughts, your worries. Elijah is in the presence of God and all he could talk about was, I'm the only prophet left. If you actually go back into chapter 17, or it's 18, he ran into Obadiah, who was another person that was actually working for the Lord. And the Bible says, Obadiah told him, he says, I've hid a hundred prophets in the cave when they were, when King Ahab and Jezebel was killing prophets. I hid a hundred in the cave. These are still prophets of God. Even after Obadiah told him that, he still went on saying, I'm the only prophet left. Woe is me. I'm the only prophet left and now they're going to kill me, Lord. You can carry that same concern with you and it could beat you down. Amen. Until you learn to separate yourself from those thoughts and just focus on what God has to say. I'm going to close with this last point. If you go back into verse 13. Verse 12, it says, after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And the voice said, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied again, I have zealously served the Lord God. Look, same narrative. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down their, your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. Then the Lord said to him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Heziel to be king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphath, from the town of Abel Mohola, to replace you as my prophet. Anyone who escapes from Heziel will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I will preserve 7,000 others in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal or kissed him. When God finally got his attention, he was able to reveal to him that you are not the only prophet left. There are still 7,000 others who have not bowed. Amen? When, we, when God finally gets our attention, now we can actually hear the truth. The Bible says the enemy is a liar and a father of lies. When he when he's lies, he's speaking his native language, one translation said. And sometimes we get so caught up in the lies of what we see with our eyes that we take that to be truth. And we don't give God a chance to actually reveal to us what the situation really is. Elijah went there thinking he was the only prophet left and that he was going to die. And after he left God's presence, he realized he wasn't the only one left. And not only was he not going to die, God was also preserving his legacy because there was a prophet, it was Elisha who was going to carry on the ministry. Amen. And so, number one, you got to separate yourself from the situation. You got to learn how to walk away sometimes. Go to your quiet place and just say, God, I'm going I'm to turn off the news. 
You watch too much news, you, you start to get anxious. You listen to too much conversations, you start to get anxious or get angry. One of them. Amen? Turn it off. Go to the quiet place. Separate yourself from the situation. But when you get in God's presence, if the enemy can distract you and have you be in God's presence but not take advantage of what it means to be in his presence, you got to separate yourself from your thoughts. Amen? And number three, you, take, you just listen and obey what God tells you to do. God told Elijah, go back the same way you came. Anoint these people, and, and they're going to continue on the legacy because you're not the only one left. I'm still with you. I'm still God. Amen? I want us all to stand to our feet. As I invite the, minister, the, 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 the musicians to come forward and the praise team. And just bow your head and close your eyes. Today, I want to pray for anyone who is overwhelmed this morning. Today, I want to pray for anyone who's just going through a situation and you just feel like all you see is just tragedy around you and you just don't know how you're going to make it. Today, I pray that as we meditate on this scripture, that we will hear the truth, that God will reveal to us that he is right there with us and this is not our end. Father, we come to you right now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you that you are God and that you still sit on the throne. Lord, we thank you for this demonstration that we see even with the prophet Elijah, the, the great man of God. That even he went through a season of discouragement and depression. Lord, I pray that that might be encouraging to someone because sometimes when we feel like we're not at our best. When our faith is weakened, sometimes we get to question ourselves and think there's something wrong with us. But this passage of test shows us that everybody goes through challenging seasons in life. But Lord God, the picture, the bigger picture is that where are we placing our focus in those seasons? As long as we continue to focus on the problem, we will be filled with anxious thoughts. We will be filled with fear and worry. But the moment we separate ourselves from the situation and get into the presence of God, Lord God, then that's where hope is renewed. Lord, your word says the joy of the Lord is our strength, oh God. If, if God, if any of us here don't have a meeting place with you, let one be established today that anytime there's something that's going on in our lives, and not just when things are going wrong, even when things are going right, I will have this meeting place where I'll come and meet with God every day. And as we meet in your, in your presence, God, help us, Lord God, to go there with a clear mind so that we can hear your voice, that we can hear what you have to say on the matter, that we don't do all the talking but give a chance for you to speak. Lord, we know that you are a God who is ever-present. You, your word says you are a refuge and our strength and ever-present help even in the times of trouble. And so, Father, right now, I pray that you help those right now who are bent beneath their loads. Lord, I pray that encouragement may start to fill the hearts of those who right now are is concerned with a load of care, burdened with a load of care. Lord God, I pray that you may begin to grant them peace, Lord, and reveal to them the, to them the truth about the situation they're facing. Father, we've all been there. We've all look in our past and, and, and think about things that we've gone through. And we didn't know if we were going to make it out to the other side. But God, as we look back, we see that you were always there. We can see your hand in the situation. It's always in the middle of the storm that it makes it, us hard, it, make it hard to see your hand. It's afterwards we can look back and see that you were always there. Well, Lord God, this, this, this storm that they're facing is no different. You're right where you always are, present. And God, I thank you that even though weeping may endure for a night, that joy may come in the morning. Help us, Lord God, to just commune with you. Help us to see things the way you see it, Lord. Help us to know that this is not our end. God, you are a God who sits on the throne. And regardless of what we're facing, God, you have enough power to turn it around. And I pray that you may turn it around in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.